announcement. I wanted to let you know that I got to attend man camp this weekend um, that Emmanuel puts on. I got to attend with Robert, and um, there was a wonderful exposition of Ephesians 6, the armor of God, and then there was a cornhole tournament, and uh, Robert and I easily cruised to the semifinals where we were defeated. Um, so next year, we need more Redeemer people to go so that we can vanquish our foes and uh, win the cornhole tournament. But uh, turn to Acts 2. Uh, we were blessed to hear uh, the word preached last week by R- R- Ramiro. I keep calling him Redeemer on accident. But um, <laughs> blessed to hear the word preached by Ramiro, um, God's gospel plan. Uh, Jesus was attested to by signs and works and powers, wonders. Um, he was crucified at the hands of lawless men. And then he was raised up, uh, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Uh, Such a blessing to hear that word preached. And as we look at that text and this text together, what we see is a lot of finger pointing, uh, if we're being honest. Peter is uh, pointing his finger at the lawless men. It was at the hand of lawless men that Christ was crucified. He's also clearly pointing a finger at the Israelites. He's saying, you crucified him. Uh, You crucified him by the hands of lawless men. And you could say, in a sense, he's also pointing a finger at God. Remember, that was one of the points in the passage, was that this was God's plan. It was according to his foreknowledge that Jesus was delivered up to be crucified. Well, in our text, uh, we'll see that a purpose of our text is to point a finger at Christ about Pentecost. You see, Peter in his sermon has already brought up that this miracle, this astounding miracle that's been put on display, that these uh, men and women are speaking in these different languages, the disciples are speaking in different languages, um, never before seen, there's a crowd gathering, and Peter begins to stand and explain, and first he quotes from Joel 2 to say, this is the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out. But the question is, who poured out the Holy Spirit? That's where Peter begins to go to next. And if you look after our passage, so our passage is verses 25 through 32, Acts 2, verses 25 through 32, but look at verse 33, the next verse, and you really see the point of our passage there. He says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. He's saying it is Jesus who is doing this. He, the one whom you crucified and killed, he has raised, he is the one who is pouring out the Holy Spirit. Christ Even though they crucified him, it was not possible for the grave to hold him, and he was raised up, he ascended to the Father's right hand, and he is pouring out what they are seeing. And so our text today, that's not part of our text today, but our text today is proof along the way that Christ did rise from the dead. And Peter's going to quote a passage of Old Testament scripture to say that this was prophesied in the Old Testament, that Christ would rise. And his point is, yes, you crucified him, But he said he was going to be killed. He also said that he was going to be raised and that he would pour out the Spirit on the apostles. And this is what has happened. So as we look at this text and as he quotes this Old Testament passage coming from David, we're going to see what David has put his hope in regarding Christ. We're going to see why he has hope that David, as a prophet, saw forward to this event. And so as we look at this hope, we're going to see three aspects of biblical hope. Three aspects of biblical hope. The basis of hope, the need of hope, and the fulfillment of hope. Three aspects of biblical hope. The basis of hope, the need of hope, and the fulfillment of hope. So follow along as I read Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. 
for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, this is Peter speaking. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this text, we pray that you would help us understand. Help us understand what Peter is doing with this text. Help us understand why he quotes Psalm 16 and what Psalm 16 is about. Help us understand why this proves the resurrection, why Peter is bringing it up now and speaking to these Israelites. We pray that you would help us, help us understand. And as we do, we pray that you would give us soft hearts, um, soft hearts that are ready to be convicted of our sin, ready to confess to you and return to faithfulness and obedience. And we pray, Father, that you would help us share in David's hope, um, hope in you, hope in God, hope in the Messiah. Help us share that same hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first aspect of biblical hope is the basis, the foundation of hope, the basis of hope. And for this, I want us to actually turn back to Psalm 16, where our scripture reading was from, and where this passage is that uh, Peter is pulling this quote from. Psalm 16. Starting in verse 1, David says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. So already you can see in the psalm that David is taking refuge in the Lord. He's viewing the Lord as his protection, as his hope, and really his only hope, uh, even in the midst of enemies. David is... Uh, putting his hope in God. God is the basis of David's hope. And so he's not going to run after other gods. Look down at verse 5. Instead, he says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. So while others are chasing after other gods, fake gods, David has put all of his hope in the true God. It is with the true God that his lot is with. Um, God has been that refuge for David. And if you look down at verse 8, that's where Peter's quotation begins. David writes, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. It's obvious what he's saying, right? He knows the Lord is with him, and so he's not going to be shaken. God is his refuge. God is his hope. Well, that's where the quotation begins, and so we can turn back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 25, you can see what Peter's doing there. Uh, Peter begins to quote this in the past tense. I think, you know, he knows David is speaking, and he quotes it in the past tense instead of present. And he says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. My flesh also will dwell in hope. Since he knows the Lord is with him, he can dwell in hope. What gives him this hope? Look at verse 27. Peter, quoting the psalm, says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. So this confidence, this hope that David has, is that God is not going to abandon him. 
He's not going to abandon his soul to Hades. Remember, Hades was the holding place for the dead. And so he's saying God is not going to abandon him to death. After David dies, he's not going to be left there forever. God's not going to forget about David. Skip down to verse 28. He says, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And I think this is still speaking of where he is headed. I think he's saying, you're not going to abandon me. Instead, I'm going to be in your presence. And there's not going to be the terror that you might expect from being in God's presence. Instead, he's going to be full of joy because he has this confidence, this hope in the Lord. He trusts in the Lord, and the Lord is trustworthy. Before we keep going, I just want to point out, we are experts at putting our hope in all of the wrong things, right? Uh, we can put our hope in a sports team or in entertainment to distract us uh, and make our pain go away. We put our hope in a career as we have all these ambitions. We put our hope in our spouse to meet all of our needs or satisfy us. We put our hopes in our, our children that they'll be perfect and wonderful and take care of us in our old age. Uh, give us something to brag about. Uh, we even can put our hope in our church and our church body, you know, um, resting all of our security and hope in each other. All of these things are the wrong area to put our hope, even though they're good things. Uh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so you don't, you, we can't set our hope in these temporary things. We can't depend on the riches in our savings account for our security. We can't depend on our own health or our own career. We don't set our hope in any of these things. We can't depend on insurance companies. Uh, we can't put all of our hope in politicians. Any other basis that you might think of, if we put our hope in those things, we will be disappointed. No question. Everything and everyone will let you down if you put your hope in them, except for God. And David knew this, and Peter knew this, and you need to know this. Only God can give you security. Only he is the true refuge that we can hide in. Only he will never abandon you if you trust in him. So put your trust in him. Um, because we need to. That's the next aspect of biblical hope. Um, the Bible doesn't shy away from this, the need of hope, that we do need hope. That's the ne next aspect, the need of hope. Look at verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. David died. That's <laughs> Peter's point, right? David died and was buried and his tomb is with us to, his day, to this day. So was David's hope disappointed? That's been a thousand years, right? If David is a thousand BC, and this is now after the life of Christ. A thousand years David died, and he's been in the tomb, and they still knew in that day where his tomb was. They could go there. Does that mean David put his hope in the wrong place? That God did abandon him to the grave. David was so confident in God, and yet Peter can say with confidence, he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Before we get to the answer of that question, again, I just want to stop to say this is our need as well. David died, and he needed the Lord. He needed to trust the Lord, knowing that the Lord wouldn't abandon him, and we have a need of hope Two, uh, you are going to die also. You are going to descend into death just like David, and it might be soon. It certainly will be sooner than you expect. All of us. Death is our great opponent because you're a sinner just like me, and so we deserve condemnation after we die. We need hope, and every false religion promises this hope. Every other religion says, depend on something else, depend on your works, 
depend on someone else's works, depend on some religious action you're doing, put your hope in this false system, but there's only one basis of hope, and that's the Lord himself. God is the only basis, the only foundation of hope, the true God. Only he can provide this hope even in death, and this hope is fulfilled in Christ, and that's our third aspect. Third aspect of biblical hope is the fulfillment of hope. Look at verse 30. He says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he, David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Jesus is the fulfillment of this hope. David was trusting in God. That's the basis of his hope. But David also knows he's going to die, and he is looking forward to this fulfillment of his hope, and the fulfillment is Christ. And if you've been reading this text as we've been reading this text, there's probably a question in the back of your mind of what is Peter doing with this text? Why does he say this? Seems like he is saying that David had this constant, confidence, and yet David's been in the grave for a thousand years. And so what is he doing? And I think what he's doing is he's zooming in on verse 10 in Psalm 16. This is in verse 27 in Acts 2. Does that make sense? Verse 10 of Psalm 16, but you'll see it in in verse 27 of Acts 2. He says, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Peter's quoting this And then saying, David saw corruption. David saw decay. He's still in the tomb. And so what is his point? I think Peter's point is the last part of that verse cannot be considered fulfilled by David himself. The last part of that verse is not true about David. It was about someone else. And so then the question for us is, well, then what do we think about Psalm 16? Um, Was Psalm 16 true? Well, just like every other time that we've been seeing Peter interpret these Old Testament passages, we have a few options. Uh, Some would say that what Peter is doing here, again, as always, this is always what people say, uh, what Peter is doing is he is reinterpreting Psalm 16, that David meant something that he meant uh, something for himself, and now Peter is taking this verse and reinterpreting it and applying it to Christ, changing the meaning. But we have to reject that, right? Because look at verse 30. Look at what he says. He says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. So you can't say that Peter is reinterpreting here. You can't say that Peter is getting this wrong. You can't say that he's making this up or that he's changing the meaning of the text because that's not what he says. He says, no, David knew what he was doing. David was a prophet and he was looking forward and he knew exactly who he was talking about. So it can't be that Peter is creatively reinterpreting. There are other options Uh, like this as well. Um, Options that kind of toe the line of inerrancy, maybe cross the line of denying inerrancy of Scripture. You'd have some that would say, well, really, Psalm 16 is all about David, but the end of verse 10, that the Holy One will not see corruption, that one wasn't really true about David. But that's okay because David was a type of the Messiah. He's the Davidic king. And so since that wasn't fulfilled in David's life, we know it'll be fulfilled in the Messiah's life. You see what they're saying there? It's okay that it wasn't true about David because it ended up being true about the Messiah. Again, that should make us uncomfortable, right? If it's the scriptures, we should understand that it's true because God said it. That should make us uncomfortable. Well, the next option Some would say that all of Psalm 16, and listen to this one, uh, all of Psalm 16 is actually meant to be from the viewpoint of Christ. 
Some would say that the whole psalm is a messianic psalm, speaking in the first person from the viewpoint of, of the Messiah. David is, as a prophet, speaking as if he's fr- from the perspective of the Messiah, prophetically. This preserves inerrancy. This would make it so the, the whole psalm is talking about the Christ, and so Peter recognizes that, and there's no contradiction there. And it makes sense of what Peter is saying, that David is a prophet and he's looking forward to the Messiah. And so it's not wrong for those reasons. I think the problem with this view is that we don't really see that anywhere else in Scripture. Occasionally, you do have the prophets um, speaking in the first person um, about an event in the future. You know, it'll personify or it'll take the voice of someone else. But usually when that happens, it's very clear, right? Um, But in Psalm 16, I think if you just read Psalm 16 and we hear that it's written by David and then he's speaking in the first person, we just assume that that's about David. He's writing that about himself. There's no uh, report of speech like the Lord said to my Lord uh, or something like that to where it makes sense why the Messiah would be speaking in first person there. Okay? All right, so I think the best option, sorry to wear you out with so many options, but I think the best option is, is actually the easiest option. And to me, it preserves the inerrancy of both texts, and it's a normal interpretation of both texts. And that's just to say that David is not referring to himself when he s- speaks of the Holy One. Maybe that was already really obvious to you um, when you read this, um, or maybe not. Um, some of us have never read the text this way. But usually, that, that name, the Holy One, is reserved for God himself anyways. Um, occasionally, you have it used um, for an angel, or you have it used for the high priest. But usually, um, the Holy One is a name that's reserved for God, the Holy One of Israel. That's a name for God. And so I think it would have been pretty odd anyways for David to use that to refer to himself. After he's been speaking in first person to say, you will not abandon my soul uh, to to uh, Hades or let your Holy One see corruption, uh, I think that would be odd for David to refer to himself as the Holy One. Instead, I think what he's saying is David has this confidence that God, that, that he will not be abandoned to Hades, and David has this confidence that the Holy One will not see corruption. David has the confidence that David will not be abandoned to Hades, that God's not going to forget about him but also the confidence that the Holy One, the Messiah, will not see corruption. The Holy One can't be David because David did decay. He did see this corruption in the grave. That's Peter's point, right? We're all together on that. Um, Peter's point is this can't be David. In the Gospels, we hear a demon who knows who Christ is. He refers to Christ as the Holy One of God. Do you remember that? And even in one of Peter's confessions, when Peter is confessing the Christ, he says, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And he's speaking of Christ in a messianic sense. We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And I think that David is doing something similar here, that the scriptures are speaking of Jesus, the Holy One, that he is not going to see decay. Even though he is going to die, he's not going to stay in the grave long enough to rot and see decay. God would not allow it, just like God would not allow David's soul to be abandoned to Hades. That's how I understand this passage. And I think that Peter is saying that this is all possible because David is a prophet and because David knew the promises that he had received from the Lord. David knew about a future king. Look again at verse 30. He says, Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on this throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. So Peter is saying that David knew what he was doing. He was looking ahead, speaking about the Christ. That he would have this uh, forever king on the throne, a descendant of David. Psalm 132 says, the Lord swore to David, this is Psalm 132 verses 11 and 12, the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back, one of the sons of your body I will set on your throne, if your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them. 
their, son, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. This psalm, Psalm 132, is remembering the time, and maybe you remember this story, remembering the time when David offered to build God a house. Do you remember this story? Uh, the temple had been in the tabernacle, like a tent that was portable, um, for as long as Israel had been a nation, as long, all the way back to Mount Sinai. And David is there as a king. He's just built his own house, and he's seeing the Lord's tabernacle as a tent, and he offers to build the Lord a house. And first, the prophet Nathan hears it and essentially gives him the go-ahead, right? Um, that sounds good. Go and do it. But then later that night, uh, the Lord speaks through Nathan. And what he says through Nathan is that David is not going to build him a house. He doesn't need David to do this, and he never asked for this. Instead, God is going to build David a house. Do you remember this? Instead, God was going to build David a house, the house of David, this family that would produce a line of kings, the house of David. And the end of that passage says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's 2 Samuel, verse, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. I think Peter's point is that David knew these promises. And he knew that someday there would be a king that would reign forever, one from his line. And so David, as a prophet, was speaking as a prophet and speaking about Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. I think if we were to summarize, we would say David will not be abandoned to Hades, but David did see corruption in the grave. The Messiah would not be abandoned to Hades, and he would not see corruption. Does that make sense? David would not be abandoned to Hades. The Lord's not going to forget about him, but he did see decay in the grave. The Messiah, both of those things are true. He neither saw, uh, he neither was abandoned, nor did he see decay in the grave. Peter proves this with the scriptures, that the scriptures speak about Jesus' resurrection. And then he goes on in verse 32. He says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So he's standing there. Remember it says he stood with the 11. So he's maybe got the 11 behind him or at his side. And probably still standing with all the other disciples that were there when this miracle took place. Anyone else who saw Christ and his resurrection? Peter's saying, we are all witnesses. God raised him up. We saw him. We're eyewitnesses like we've spoken about before. We are witnesses. He lives even though you crucified him. That's Peter's message to them. He lives even though you crucified him, and he has poured out this miracle that you're seeing, so you need to repent and believe. As we conclude, let's zoom out one more time. Let's see the big picture of what he's doing. There's been this astounding miracle, the sound like a wind, the tongues of fire. They're speaking in these miraculous, uh, they're miraculously speaking in foreign languages. And the crowd begins to form, and Peter stands up. He answers the mockers. He says these are not drunk. Instead, this is the Holy Spirit. And he quotes Joel 2 to show that this is the kind of ministry that the Holy Spirit does. But then Peter is telling them Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he quotes Psalm 16 in our passage today. And then he tells them Jesus has ascended into the heavens. And then he'll quote Psalm 110. That's our passage, our topic next time. Jesus has been raised. Jesus has ascended, and it is him. He's the one who's poured out the Holy Spirit. You killed him, but he rose, and he's doing this. So you need to repent and believe. That is Peter's message in this sermon. But we've been so blessed today because along the way, one of the things that Peter was trying to prove from the scriptures was that 
The scriptures spoke about how the Holy One would be raised, that Christ would be raised from the dead. And so we get to see him expositionally teach, preach on this passage where David has so much hope and confidence in the Lord. He trusts all the way in the Lord. He will not be shaken because he knows the Lord is at his right hand. He knows that he will not be abandoned because he looks forward and sees that the Holy One will not see corruption. David had this hope because he trusted God. He looked forward to the Messiah, and he knew that the Messiah would not see decay in the grave. And again, you and I need this same hope. The greatest terror in our life, the greatest opponent in our life is death. The fact that all of us are going to go to the grave, and after the grave, like I've said many times before, we wouldn't know what to do. You know, what do we do with ourselves after we die? We can't walk somewhere. Right? We can't do anything. There is a terror to going down to the grave. We're helpless again, just like we were when we were an infant. We need somebody to take care of us. We need to not be abandoned. And so the question is, will you be abandoned in the grave? Will you suffer torment forever? And if not, how do you know? What is your confidence that you will not be abandoned? Well, David's basis, his foundation of hope was God himself. He trusted in God. He put all of his trust in God as a firm foundation. That's where all of David's hope was. And so do you have that same confidence? Do you have this promise of eternal life from God? That even though you would go to the grave, that you would still live forever with joy with him? Or are you going to be abandoned to the grave? God did not let his Holy One see corruption. He did not let him see decay. He was resurrected before that could happen. This was the fulfillment of David's hope, Jesus being raised from the dead so he could be this forever king reigning on the throne of David. Is this the fulfillment of your hope? Have you placed all your hope and trust in God who has done this? Does the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead, is this what gives you your assurance that you're going to be raised from the dead? It's the only way to have this confidence and this hope, to trust in him. Are you in Christ so that the power that raised Christ from the dead is also going to raise you from the dead? If you're a believer in Christ, if you've repented of your sins, if you've placed your faith and your trust, your confidence in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, he said, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So our hope is the exact same as David's. We should have the confidence that we will not be abandoned Because the Messiah was raised and he didn't see corruption. God will not abandon us. He fulfills all of his promises to us. And as the psalm says, in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us follow in the footsteps of King David this man who placed all of his hope and confidence so that he would not be shaken, placed his hope and his confidence in you. He looked forward to the day when the Messiah would be raised. Help us have that same confidence as we look backward to the day when the Messiah was raised. Help us see that resurrection and understand that you, the Lord of the universe, the God of all. You are the one who raised from the dead. You are the one who powerfully works to conquer death. And that if we are in Christ, we can place our hope and our trust in you that you will not abandon us.
Help us fix our minds on that. Help us fix our hope on that. Help us think about that glorious day when we'll be with you and experience that fullness of joy, pleasures at your right hand forevermore. Help us remember and be grateful. And Father, we pray as a church body, all of us, we pray for those who don't know you, uh, even in this room. We pray that they would come to know you, that they would stop stubbornly refusing to repent of their sin, but instead accept and realize that they are sinners and they've sinned against you. We pray that you would soften their hearts and help them realize that grace and forgiveness, peace with God, is available because of what Christ has done on the cross. Each of us can have this hope, this confidence, hope of eternal life with you. We pray that you would soften hearts, uh, including our own. Help us learn your word, receive it, and put our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen.